video, we talked about Dirichlet convolution, which is an operation we defined on arithmetic functions, which uh, evaluated at n is the sum over the divisors of n of f of d times g of n over d, where f and g are our given arithmetic functions. Now, we said that uh, using Dirichlet convolution, we can take the set of arithmetic functions and form a, the algebraic structure known as a ring. And we mentioned at the end that a ring doesn't typically allow for division. Uh, because division, when you have, when you allow division, that's what becomes a field. However, there is sort of a way to invert um, function, in, invert Dirichlet convolution, and we're going to talk about that today. And in fact, there is something known as um, a Dirichlet inverse. Dirichlet inverse. Uh, but this exists only for uh, given arithmetic functions such that f of 1 is not equal to 0. Um, so it's not well defined over all arithmetic functions. However, we're going to introduce a different type of inverse in this video. So. In the video of about sums over divisors, uh, we showed that the sum over the divisors of n of mu of d, where mu is the Mobius function, was equal to e of n, where again e of n is sort of this uh, this like delta-like function where it's one if n equals one and zero else, right? So. It, if n is greater than 1, the sum is going to be 0. And if n equals 1, then we only have mu of 1, which is equal to 1. So it's just 1. Now, in terms of Dirichlet convolution, uh, this equation can be expressed as mu star 1 equals e, where 1 is the constant 1 function, right? Because you can think of it as 1 of n over d here, where no matter what n over d is, this is just going to be 1, and multiplying by 1 doesn't you know, affect anything. So we have mu star 1 equals e. And we noted that e was uh, the identity for uh, Dirichlet convolution. So what that means is that we can it basically means that mu and 1 are inverses in this Dirichlet, um, in this Dirichlet ring. So if we're given a function f of n is equal to a sum over the divisors of n of g of d, which we have considered lots of times, then Another way to write this in terms of Dirichlet convolution is that f is g star 1. And now if we take this equation, let me zoom in a bit, if we take this equation and we star both sides by mu, then using the fact that, well, so first we would write it like this, right? because we're taking this function g star 1 and then starring mu. But since Dirichlet convolution is associative, this is just g star 1 star mu. And since Dirichlet convolution is commutative, this is the same thing as mu star 1, which is just e. And since e is the identity, this is just g. So we can take this equation and flip it and solve for g, like so. And this is a powerful result, especially because here, uh, or maybe a more convenient way to look at this is uh, if you swap the order of the terms, uh, if you say mu of d, f of n over d, 
because here we know that we only have to consider the divisors of n uh, such that uh, there are, you know you restrict the prime the multiplicity of each prime right because if one of the prime factors is greater has an exponent greater than one then we know that the term the Mobius term associated to that will be zero. Um, so that makes computing this kind of easy in some cases, right? So let's consider an example, of course. Um, now, we showed in that uh, sum over divisors video that the sum of the divisors of phi of d, where phi is the Euler totient function, is equal to n. So in other words, phi star 1 equals i, where i is the identity uh, i of n equals n. So if we invert this, right, we will get phi is equal to i star mu. So um, this would be, um, I, sorry, uh, this would be the sum of the divisors of n, uh, d times mu of n over d. Or another way to write this would be sum over divisors of n, n over d, mu of d. And then this n here, right, is a constant with respect to the sum. So we could take that out and say n sum over the divisors of n, mu of d over d. Right, so this is equal to phi of n. All right, now let's uh, consider a, a more interesting example that will say something about uh, the Mobius function. So first, let me talk about roots of unity, just in case anyone hasn't seen that before. Um, so let me, okay, that's a good enough circle, I guess. Um, so let's consider the unit circle in the complex plane. So we're working over the complex numbers here, right? So this would be one, so this is the origin zero. Uh, here we would have i, this would be negative one, this would be negative i, right? So this is the, the unit circle in the complex plane. Now, roots of unity are the complex solutions to the polynomial equation z to the n equals 1. And so, for a specific n, you would call them the nth roots of unity. So, for instance, uh, the first root of unity, there's only one, is just 1, right? It's the unique equation to z equals 1. The second roots of unity, right, are the, equation, uh, the solutions to z squared equals 1, which would be 1 and negative 1. And then the third roots of unity would be 1, and then a number here, and then a number here, right? And so the nice way to express um, these roots of unity is in polar form, right? Because in polar form, exponentiation is really easy. So we see that um, a, uh, so I'm going to use the ex exponential notation here just to make it cleaner. So this stands for e to the, and then whatever's inside the parentheses. So for instance, e to the two pi i over n if you take this complex number and raise it to the nth power, um, well, raising an exponent to a power, then you multiply uh, the exponent by what's inside of the exponential. So this just becomes e to the 2 pi i, um, which is 2 pi radians around the circle, which is just 1. So therefore, this number is a nth root of unity. Now, there's something called a primitive nth root of unity, right? Notice that when we made the jump from, uh, from z equals 1 to z squared equals 1, right? 1 
is both a first root of unity and a second root of unity. However, when we jump from 1 to 2, we gain this new uh, root of unity, negative 1. Then when we go to 3, we still have 1, and then we gain two, two new uh, solutions here and here. Uh, this one's typically called omega, and this one would be omega squared. Um, but, you know, just the, this is just the third root of unity, so this would be e... Uh, I guess I'll be consistent, exp of 2 pi i over 3. It's a pi here. Okay, this is bad. Um, oops, 2 pi i. Okay. Um, z to the 4th equals 1, right? So now when we consider z to the 4th equals 1, we would have 1 i negative 1 and negative i. So 1 and, I, one and negative 1 are already uh, roots of unity that we've at, like had in our list, but i and negative i are the new ones. So basically, whenever we add a new one, quote, a new one to our list, right, if we're just listing the uh, roots of unity as they appear uniquely, then... Um, Whatever n, right, so this would be 1, this would be 2, this would be 3, this would be 4. Whatever n these numbers first appear for, those would be the primitive roots. So i is, the prim is a primitive fourth root of unity. Um, and one way to see, uh, you know, which... Um, or basically all of the nth roots of unity are going to be some power of this uh, first of this first one, right? e to the 2 pi i over n is going to be the first um, the, the first, uh, how do I say it? It's going to be the first nth root of unity that isn't 1, well except when n equals 1 then it'll be 1, but the first nth root of unity that sort of goes, travels some distance along the circle, right? And so every other root of unity will just be some power of this one, k. And so this is just going to be exp of 2 pi i k over n. Now if k and n share some factor, then this fraction can be reduced, and then what we would get is, um, let's say k over n reduces to k prime over d. Then we know d is a divisor of n, and essentially this will be a dth root of unity. And if this is fully reduced, um, and we can't reduce it anymore, then that's going to be the condition that uh, this is a primitive root, right? So basically, if we have 2 pi i, k over n is our complex, is our root of unity. If k and n are co-prime, then uh, this, this will be a primitive nth root of unity. Okay, so I know this sort of uh, explanation is like, it took a while and sort of backtrack from the, the point of the video, but just in case anyone hasn't seen that before, uh, this condition is what we need to have a primitive nth root of unity. And as we see here, if k and n aren't co-prime and they share some factor, then we can reduce it to get some primitive, uh, a primitive nth root of unity, right? So if we consider all of the fourth roots, all of the fourth roots of unity, 1, i, negative 1, negative i, well, the numbers that are co-prime to 4, namely 1 and 3, correspond to the primitive roots. And then for 2 over 4, that reduces to 1 half, and so that corresponds to the primitive second root of unity, negative 1. And then 4 over 4 
reduces to 1 over 1, which corresponds to the primitive one th first root of unity. So now let's consider this function f of n to be the sum of primitive primitive nth roots of unity. Okay? So f of 1, right, would just be 1 because um because it's just, you know, the fir the first root of unity is 1. So that's that's it. And now uh basically this argument here tells us that um, if we want to basically the sum the sum of nth roots of unity if we look at the whole list of nth roots of unity it's going to split into Right, we can split up the nth roots of unity by their primitiveness. And they're going to be primitive, they're going to be primitive dth roots of unity for some divisor of n. So we can sum over the divisors of n f of d, because we split it up into the primitive roots, and then sum the primitive roots, and then take those sums and add those together. Now, what are the sums of nth roots of unity? Well, let's consider z equals x of 2 pi i over n. And we're going to consider n is bigger than 1 because we've already dealt with the case of n equals 1. Then the nth roots of unity are 1, z, dot, 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 z to the n minus 1, right? It's all the pow it's n different powers of z. So their sum, if we were to sum up these numbers, right, 1 plus z plus dot 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 plus z to the n minus 1, this is a geometric sum, a geometric progression, so uh, this is going to be equal to z to the n minus 1 over z minus 1. And if you haven't seen this, uh, multiply both sides by z minus 1, and a lot of terms will cancel out. Now, we know z is an nth root of unity. So by definition, z to the n is 1. So z to the n minus 1 is going to give 0. And z, we chose z to not equal 1, so z minus 1 is not equal to 0, so this fraction equals 0. So what we showed is that for n greater than 1, this sum, so n greater than 1, this sum equals 0. But when n equals 1, it was equal to 1. Therefore, the sum divisors uh, over the divisors of n of f of d equals e of n. But what function do we know that already satisfies this? We know that the sum of the divisors of the Mobius function equals e of n. And so using Mobius inversion, right, this basically says that f star 1 equals e. And we can Mobius invert to give f equals e star mu, which is just mu. So this proves that f and mu have to be the same function. Therefore, we can interpret the Mobius function, mu of n, as the sum of primitive nth roots of unity. And I think that's pretty cool. So anyway, I hope you liked that video, and I hope to see you in the next one.